Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here for World Cultures this time, and looking at chapters one and two, our introduction to world cultures, sort of setting an overview, setting the stage, so to speak, for uh, what we're going to be studying this year, looking at everything in, in these two chapters from the earliest humans to modern technology and things. So let's jump in and get started. Oh, but before we do, get your study guide out. I'll wait. Got it? Okay. Get your study guide out because the reason why you want to have it out, we're going to go through a lot of things on the study guide. So if you've got that out, fill them out as I go along. If I go too fast, hey, pause me. You've got the power. Okay? So here we go. Moving on ahead down here at the bottom. Okay? One of the things we look at is the idea of the global environment, where we live. Okay? Part of the here on Earth. And they talk about some things in terms of the Earth and the fact that we use maps and all maps have a problem. And that problem is something called distortion. Okay? Distortion comes from the fact that as we uh, try to make it flat and into a squared shape or a, a rectangular shape as opposed to a round circular shape, uh, we distort the images the further we get away from the poles. Okay? And I'll explain that a little bit more in just a moment when we come down here to this other depiction of the Earth. Okay, this is showing a globe here, and we use on here these lines of latitude and longitude, which are used to describe location. Okay, now latitude, these are the lines that run east and west, like the equator, the Tropic of Cancer, the Tropic of Capricorn. These things measure how far north and south we are, They're like hash marks on a football field, for example. Okay, and then we also have lines of longitude okay, that run north and south. Okay, and these are used to measure things east and west. Okay, now um, using these things to, to measure things, we can find our exact location versus a relative location. Exact saying exactly the spot versus relative. It's next to the White House. If you're describing how to get to your house, kind of thing. Not the one in Washington D.C., but you've got a brick house next to the White House. Anyway. Um, looking at lines of uh, latitude which move east and west, as we said, these are also called parallels because they don't touch each other. They run parallel so they don't ever touch. Lines of longitude are also called meridians, and you'll notice they're farthest apart from each other at the equator, and the further you go towards the pole, or the further you go towards the, uh, either one of the poles, north or south poles, they get closer and closer together. And it's then making those lines straight on a flat map that leads to that distortion. Okay, they talk about hills and plains and parts of our environment. Well, hills and mountains have something that's referred to as, as high elevation, okay? And so we can see here this big change in elevation, that's high elevation. Whereas plains over here have low elevation, well, except for those mountains in the background which have high elevation. Okay. Changes in human history, they talk about one of these being the uh, advent of agriculture, which is growing our own food as opposed to being hunters and gatherers, okay? And that leads to the first civilizations, okay? Because if we're wandering around, we can't stop and develop culture and have buildings and a division of labor. We'll get into all that in a moment, okay? Now, some of our earliest uh, systems of government are systems where there's one guy in charge. He's the chief, he's the king, he's whatever kind of ruler you want to call him. That one guy is in charge. Well, if you apply that to an economy, okay, and have the government in charge of the economy, you've got a command economy. The government controls it. They say who works where, what's produced, how many, how what. Okay. Now we're looking at the idea of technology. And we think of technology as being things like, hey, Mr. Pull is recording our lectures. We're watching them on our laptops. That's the type of technology. Well, technology is really any kind of tool. Okay? It could be even a simple stone tool from the Stone Age. That was their technology. Pen and paper, technology, pencil, blackboard, all the old things we don't use so much in school all at one time were cutting edge technology. Okay? The new technology that we're talking about today, like this, has sped up the spread of ideas. As I mentioned in class, I can send out a tweet and it gets to everyone around the world instantly. Okay? I don't have that many followers, so. Don't be looking for that anytime soon. Okay, as part of our environment, we have some things that become aspects of our culture that we mentioned earlier. Okay, and one of those is religion, and the various religions throughout the world shape, you know, our culture and our beliefs. They teach us our basic values. As I just mentioned, these are a huge influence on our culture. 
Uh, depending on our religion, our culture has different ideas. But our culture helps explain why people live the way they do. Okay? It's our language, it's our belief systems, it's uh, our sense of what we like for music, what we like to eat as food. All these things are part of our culture. Now, one of the problems with culture is we often look at another culture and say, they do what? They eat squid at a baseball game? That's crazy. We eat hot dogs. Okay, they're eating fresh seafood, we're eating ground up meat bits. I'm not sure who's crazy now. Okay, that idea of judging another culture by the values of your culture is ethnocentrism. Okay, when you're doing the URQs for me in class and you come across something and you think, boy, that's strange, that's weird, that's crazy, then you, your question to ask is, why are they doing that? So, hey, I found this interesting because we do the opposite. Okay. Other aspects of our global environment, climate is one of those, which is sort of an average of the weather for a region. And it, it is affected by latitude and altitude. Okay, remember latitude, those lines that ran parallel across the Earth, like the equator, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. Okay, the higher in latitude you get, and higher means either going north or going south, further away from the equator, then your higher latitude. And higher latitude means colder weather, okay? Altitude, same way. Higher in altitude I go, the colder the weather I'm going to get, okay? So, simple way to hopefully try and remember those things. Interdependence, this is a concept of our world today, the fact that countries around the world rely on goods from other countries. Look at all the things we get from China, okay? But a lot of those things are designed here in the United States. So, there's an interdependence there going on. In terms of culture in our family, uh, in our culture, rather, I should say, we rely on the nuclear family, which is this idea of parents and their children. Okay, we'll look at some other options for that down the road here in just a moment. Okay. Now, the opposite of the nuclear family is the idea of the extended family. This is, okay, all relatives, okay? We got mom and dad here, we got the kids, oh, we got grandma and grandpa also, could be aunts and uncles, whatever, almost sort of a tribal type situation, but a lot of variations, uh, variations going on, so a lot of different things in terms of extended family. In other cultures, and in olden times, even in our culture, extended families tended to live together because there were no social support systems like a Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. Okay. Now, social mobility is a concept that is uh, relatively new in uh, Western society. This is the idea of being able to move up in social status uh, from the guys over here, the working class that can't afford uh, long pants, to these guys who have to walk around in top hats. I guess that's an improvement. I'm not sure how. Uh, but then again, I wear bow ties. Okay. So, in a lot of cultures, whatever class you're born into, you're stuck there. In ours, you can move up. Okay. And then there's an idea of cultural diffusion. This is the spread of ideas from one culture to another. Diffuse, diffusing, diffusion, okay? The spread of ideas. Look, here we are in a Middle Eastern country, uh, women uh, covered in, in purta or chadors, and we've got our McDonald's, okay? Coca-Cola, McDonald's, lots of various things that are examples of cultural fusion and the spread of ideas. Uh, still dealing with this, family is very important to culture. Okay, because we talk about those beliefs and things that make up our culture. Well, the family is the one that teaches each new generation the beliefs and ideas of the culture. Okay? And so that's a very important role they have. Other roles of the family and culture, either a key social organization, the nuclear family now, before the extended family, uh, and they are the first teachers of language. In fact, mothers are often seen as the first teachers, period. Now, there's been changes to family in today's society, where, we've, again, we've moved from that extended to a nuclear family. Uh, families are becoming more and more blended. That is to say, uh, we're seeing remarriages. We've got stepmoms, stepdads, stepbrothers, half-brothers, half-sisters, all these types of things, meaning that families are, are changing uh, continuously, not just moving from extended to nuclear, but nuclear to blended versions of that nuclear system. Okay. Now, that big change we talked about with growing our own food versus hunting and gathering is something that's referred to as the Neolithic Revolution. Okay? This is a shift from gathering to producing food, or agriculture as we know it today. Okay? And what we need to know and they talk about is this happens in river valleys throughout various parts of the world. Uh, most famous being referred to in civilization books as the Fertile Crescent uh, in the Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers of 
the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, but also if you look at the Nile, the Egyptians along that river valley, uh, in the Indus River Valley um, between India and Pakistan today, or uh, the Ganges River, or in China, uh, the Shang Dynasty as well as along the Yangtze and other rivers over there. This idea takes place at various places at almost similar times, but almost always involves river valleys, a source of water and river valleys that flood to re-fertilize the soil. Okay? Now our hunters and gatherers had to tightly control our population because they didn't control their food supply. Okay? So they would do some things that we might read about that seemed really cruel. Okay? If we think someone might end up being uh, sick or we've got too many uh, female babies being born, they might leave some of them to die. That seems cruel, but realize we have too many women of childbearing age, our population can grow too rapidly. Okay? Luckily, these things have changed. Technological advances, okay? Agriculture frees people up to do other tasks, like make tools that maybe help us grow even more food or defeat the enemy so that, you know, they're trying to steal the excess food that we've got. Lots of things that we've done, uh, all made possible by the fact that we decided to grow our own food and stay in one place. Okay? And this also allows for some things as well, which is one of this is a division of labor, okay? And we take that uh, idea of having um, agriculture and a division of labor, this leads to civilization. Because not only folks inventing new technology, they're inventing things like writing systems to uh, re make records and keep information for long periods of time. Uh, over here we've got Henry Ford's uh, idea of an assembly line. Now artisans, these are folks who are workers who are skilled in a craft, okay? Not necessarily an artist, but someone who does, you know, very high quality work. Uh, making whether it be shoes or homes or whatever it is, clothing, okay, that person is then considered an artisan. Okay. And then these things lead to the idea of trade, which, as we mentioned, if you're trading, you're going to see ideas spread, cultural diffusion. And today what we've got a problem is, is many developing nations are exporting this idea of cash crops through trade and importing manufactured goods. They don't have skilled workers and artisans so much uh, in factories producing high quality things at a low price. They've got to grow crops and export them and sell, take that money to buy manufactured things. Okay. Now, so the Industrial Revolution this is a big change. New uh, factories, it should say. Uh, these are oftentimes, let me change, correct that for you real quickly. New factor. Reese, uh, uh, maybe just one S, okay. Uh, these are usually in cities because we need a work supply. Uh, folks who are in agricultural rural areas actually will move there to get a job because some of the things they're making in the factories, new tools for farming, actually mean we need fewer laborers, okay. Now they're out of job. Luckily, we need them in the factories. Moving to the cities and increasing the size of the cities is something called urbanization, okay. Now we're looking at something called the Age of Imperialism. And the Age of Imperialism is when Europeans control other parts of the world economically and politically. Okay? That is to say, they went in and took over and forced them to produce those cash crops so that, or mined some material that they took back to their home country, turned into a tool, a manufactured good, which then they sold back to you. And they also controlled you politically. They made treaties with other places. They set the rules. You had to do what they had to say. And the Europeans, this is uh, Cecil Rhodes here, and referring to the British Empire, weren't the only ones. Hey, we were doing it too. Okay. So let's look at the idea of nationalism. If you're being taken over by some other country, after a while you get this idea that we want to become our own country and have independence, kind of like we did from England. It became America instead of the British American colonies. Okay. Nationalism is a pride in and loyalty to one's country. And this idea spreads, especially after World War II. Colonies of former European countries embrace this idea, and we're going to see a birth of new nations. A lot of them in Africa, other places around the world. That process is still going on. This is uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, the, Macedonia. These were all formerly part of a single country called Yugoslavia. This took place in the 80s. Now, after World War II, there's another thing going on, a Cold War, a war between the United States and the Soviet Union, or the, the uh, Western powers, which included Western Europe and the Soviet Union, as they competed for influence around the world. Okay? So you can see on the map here, so the division of that, some neutral countries as well. Uh, and over here we see uh, Nikita Khrushchev 
uh, arm wrestling with John F. Kennedy uh, over the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay. Another example of cultural diffusion as ideas spread from one place to another is things like jazz and rock and roll. I keep giving you examples because on the quiz, on the test, whether there's going to be a question asking which of the following is an example of cultural diffusion. Okay. Last two slides, sorry, these are a bit boring, but these are terms, so I'll go through them, explain them a little bit, you write them down, have them on your study guide, here we go. Topography, this is the mountains, hills, plains of a region. We're talking about the geography and the changes in geography in that region. Okay? Vegetation refers to the plant life of a region. Okay? Around here, a few trees, lots of fields with corn or soybeans in them. Now, we are a Judeo-Christian uh, civilization. Most people here are Christians in the United States, um, actually more Muslims now than Jews in America. But in other places in early civilizations, they believed not just in one God like we do, but they believed in many gods. And this is the idea of polytheism. Instead of monotheism, mono, one, they have poly, many, polytheism, the worship of more than one God. Okay? Now, we think we're famous for being a democracy, and we're a particular kind of democracy. We are a republic. We choose the leaders who represent us, not just the president, but we don't make the laws. It's our legislators in Springfield, uh, our congressmen and senators in Washington, D.C. They represent us, and because we elect them to represent us, we have a republic or a republican form of government. Okay? And we say that idea of diffusion is that spread of ideas and goods, uh, and not just you know goods is more the diffusion, but we spread ideas and they get adopted. That's that idea of cultural diffusion. And we've mentioned nomads before. Again, those are people who move from place to place in order to find food. There are still some nomadic groups around in the world today. Uh, perhaps the Bedouin in the Arabian Peninsula might be the best example of that that I can think of. Okay. Now, capital. And you notice on your study guide it says capital in an economic sense. We're not talking about the capital of the country or the capital of my state. We're talking about money used in business to make a profit. Okay. Build a factory or build some item. I got to build I have the machines. I've got to build a factory. I got to hire the workers. All that requires money. Money in economic terms is capital. Cash crops. These are things where many developing developing nations rely on the sale of these. This is that idea of uh, the Europeans when they colonized them wanted to, to grow these things for us. For example, a good example might be bananas. And a lot of Central American countries for the longest time that was their primary income, but the plantations were owned by Americans, and they were growing these cash crops, which were then exported to America and other places as well. We mentioned culture, but this is the, all of the things that make up a people's way of life, and so that's what you want to know for the test. Privatization is when you had a state-owned businesses and were selling these to investors. This is the idea of we had a command economy where not only did we tell you where to work and what to produce and how much to produce, we actually owned the factories you worked in. Uh, governments are realizing they're not as good at doing that and controlling things, and so they're selling those off to private investors with the goal of them making more money and the state making more money and improving efficiency. Literacy, hey, the ability to read and write, this is something that is taught in schools, another aspect of culture, uh, originally taught by parents, now something that is reinforced and expanded in schools. And then finally, we look at this idea of population density, which is sort of a measure of how many people are living uh, in an area. Usually we use per square mile uh, or per square kilometer if we're in, using the metric system. But this is something that's higher in cities. The higher the number of people per square mile or whatever we're using, then the higher the population density. Okay? Rural areas like around Monoc, much lower population density. Okay? Well, that's the uh, vast majority of chapters one and two. Sort of our introduction. Uh, on a very fast term here of what's going on in West, uh, world cultures. Any questions? See me in class. Thanks.